In February 1942, the men of the newly formed British 2nd Parachute Battalion went into action for the first time. In one of the most daring raids of the war, they seized and brought back to England vital components of a German Würzburgrader installation. Thing is, these paratroopers hadn't even completed their basic parachute jumping training when they were selected for this daring raid. It is one of the lesser known and interesting stories of the Second World War. During the Second World War, radar was one of the new technological inventions that proved crucial for the war effort. Radar was one of the reasons the Royal Air Fighters Command emerged victorious in the Battle of Britain. During the Blitz, the German Luftwaffe used radio navigation in order to pinpoint bombing targets. What followed is occasionally referred to as Battle of the Beams, as the British attempted to jam the radio navigation. As 1941 rolled along and the war on the European mainland leaned towards an obvious German victory, the British RAF bombers targeted their assaults at the German mainland. Because of the fact British bombers were able to reach German towns and cities, the Luftwaffe now rapidly had to develop its own defensive raiders. Dr. Reginald Jones of the British Air Staff managed, through intelligence work, to keep a close eye on the German technical developments in this area. In their attempts to develop defensive radars during 1941, the Germans rapidly began constructing a radar network along the Channel Coast. Jones and his team happened to, during the same time, build up a detailed overview of all Germany's radar stations. In autumn that year, several RAF planes managed to shoot several low-flying photo reconnaissance pictures. This daring reconnaissance mission revealed something even more worrisome. On the clifftop at Bruneval, a village near the French port of Le Havre, the Germans and installed a Würzburg early warning radar. So why was this so important? Well, the Würzburg radar was a ground-based gun laying radar for the Luftwaffe and Wehrmacht here, the high command. What this meant was that instead of detecting aircraft entering the field of the radar, the Würzburg would once it noticed an aircraft, track it all the way. So if an RAF aircraft was detected, the possibility of escape was non-existent. The aircraft were basically rendered to sitting ducks for the Luftwaffe or German anti-aircraft installations on the ground. Something had to be done and Jones began preparing a plan. Below the Würzburg installation lay a beach and Jones figured the British could send a boots on the ground commander raid to the beach near the radar. They would then be able to retrieve the radar from its cliff top. British Air Intelligence put forward the idea of the headquarters of combined operations. Its chief, Lord Louis Mountbatten, approved of the daring plan. Furthermore, intelligence sent to the British confirmed that radar equipment was kept in a villa less than 100 meters from the edge of the cliff where the radar station was installed. The Brits were in touch with the French resistance. They requested French resistance to explore the German defenses near Le Havre, the beach and the Würzburg satellite. Back in England, the army command quickly started planning the rest of the operation. A frontal assault on the beach would undoubtedly meet with extreme resistance and cause too many casualties. It was decided British Whitley bombers of the RAF would fly in paratroopers and drop these inland. Aircraft and crew were provided by Commander Percy Charles Pickard. They were tasked with retrieving the Würzburg Raider. It was agreed that once they completed their task, the Royal Navy would pick them up from the beach. The C Company of the 2nd Parachute Battalion of the 1st Airborne Division was the unit chosen for this task. 120 men under the command of Major John Frost would be parachuting behind enemy lines. Nearly all the men were drawn from Scottish regiments, including the Black Watch, Cameron Highlanders, King's Own Scottish Borderers and Seaforths. Flight Sergeant C.W.H. Cox, a technical expert, would accompany the group in order to dismantle the Würzburg. Sergeant Cox had never been on a ship or an aircraft before. That wasn't the only thing, though. Commander of the 1st Airborne Division, Major General Frederick Browning, wanted to keep the 1st Parachute Battalion for a larger operation. That is why the 2nd Parachute Battalion under Major John Frost was chosen. And, well, John Frost formed his company not too long ago. As a matter of fact, many paratroopers had not even completed their parachute jumping course. It sure was going to be a challenge to bring this mission to a good end. The mission statement seemed straightforward, though. The paratroopers were split into three groups. The first, under Lieutenant John Ross and Lieutenant Ewan Charteris, would be dropped first. They had to advance on the German defense strongholds on the beach and capture them. 
The second group was subdivided into three sections under the command of Frost. They had to seize the villa and the Würzburg raider. The last group under Lieutenant John Timothy would act as a reserve and guard the rear of both groups of paratroopers. Training commands for the battalion, the men didn't have much time. They soon would see action. A skill model of the area was created by the RAF's Photographic Interpretation Unit. Full-scale exercises were held on Britain's south coast. On the 20th of February 1942, the raiding party of paratroopers was ready. Due to some serious bad weather, I mean, it's England after all. Finally, on the night of the 27th to 28th of February, the weather conditions were clear enough for the raid to commence. During the night of the 27th of February, the Whitley aircraft flew over the English Channel towards Bruneval in northern France. Here they dropped the paratroopers from a height of around 180 meters onto the countryside below. Initially, Lieutenant Chartres' troops were dropped around two and a half kilometers beyond their intended position. Once landed on France's cold and icy landscape, this group of paratroopers started their trek towards their intended position. So far for a favorable start. Frost group, on the other hand, was more fortunate. Within 10 minutes, all the men assembled at the agreed upon meeting point. Without getting noticed and any opposition, they moved onto the villa where the radar equipment was being kept. Flight surgeon Cox, together with several soldiers, hauled trolleys and other equipment necessary for dismembering the radar over several obstacles, such as barbed wire and fences. Frost group surrounded the villa, and once everyone had taken their positions, Frost blew his whistle. This was the moment they had been training for. Frost later recalled, immediately, explosions, yells, and the sound of automatic fire came from the proximity of the radar set. Frost's group rushed towards the villa, blasted through the door, and tried to secure the building. Only three Germans were present in the building, of whom one was killed by Frost's men. The paratroopers learned the rest of the German soldiers were stationed not too far from the villa. Due to the firing and explosions, they certainly must have been alerted. There was no time to waste. Radar equipment in the villa was quickly secured. Now, Cox and several soldiers made their way to the Würzburg radar on the cliff top and ripped most parts away with brute force. Not too far north was a position where the Germans had been stationed, and as I had been alerted by the firefight at the villa, they now realized what was going on and opened fire on the men trying to disassemble the radar. With bullets whizzing over their heads, dissembling the radar became a real challenge. Still, the men managed to barricade themselves somewhat and for the next 30 minutes they continued exchanging fire with the Germans from both the villa and the cliff top whilst assembling the radar. Obviously, the Germans had called for backup and after half an hour, German vehicles began to arrive and Frost finally gave the order to retreat. They had only suffered one casualty and so far the mission seemed a decent success. As Frost's group withdrew to the beach, they were soon hindered by a German machine gun in a pillbox. As a matter of fact, the entire beach was still held by the Germans. The fact Charteris's group had to walk two and a half kilometers kind of ruined this part of the plan. Charteris's unit finally arrived as Frost's unit was engaged in a firefight with the German pillbox. Behind them, the Germans started assembling around the villa. It turned out, on their way to the beach, Charteris and his unit already had a deadly encounter with the German patrol. Now, outnumbering the Germans, the pillbox was quickly silenced and the beach was taken over by the paratroopers. It was past 2 a.m. by this point, yet there was no sign of the Royal Navy tasked with picking up the paratroopers. To make matters worse, Frost's radio didn't work. He was unable to communicate with the other detachments or the Royal Navy. Unable to contact the detachment meant to pick them up, Frost ordered red very lights to be fired. Immediately after Frost ordered his men to prepare to counterattack any Germans that were undoubtedly preparing to attack their position, but fortunately for the men, this would not be necessary. The Royal Navy at last showed up in the distance. Six landing craft sailed towards the coast to pick up the paratroopers. This evacuation with Germans firing from the cliffs and being generally uncoordinated was anything but orderly. Two of Frost's signalers got lost and were left behind. Some of the landing crafts were overcrowded, while others remained nearly empty. The paratroopers and the Würzburg radar equipment they carried with them were transferred to gunboats located on the English Channel. There it became clear the Navy had been delayed due to a German destroyer and two e-boats patrolling the area. Fortunately for them, while the German warships came very close to the landing craft, for some reason they hadn't spotted them. 
Dawn soon arrived, and with it, Royal Navy destroyers and a squadron of Spitfires in order to escort the paratroopers to Portsmouth. In the end, two British soldiers were killed and six wounded. All wounded survived the war. Five German soldiers were killed, and the success of the raid meant, aside from the obviously morale boost for the British public and army after such a successful, daring mission, that the army gained an incredible amount of technical knowledge of German raiders. It was the first Würzburg raider that I managed to capture, and it revealed the Germans used an advanced technology that allowed for easier fixes and operation of the raider than the British model. A rather ironic and unintended consequence was that after the Bruneville raid, the Germans now upped the security of their raiders by placing barbed wire around them. Thing is, from the air it was extremely easy to spot the raiders if surrounded by a fence and barbed wire. During D-Day, two years later, this would turn out to be a crucial advantage for the Allied bombers clearing ground for the troops landing on Normandy. I hope you enjoyed this video about the daring Bruneville raid. If you did, consider checking House of History out on Patreon and subscribing to my channel. Thank you for watching this video. And is there a person or event from the Second World War that you would like to know more about and perhaps see a video of? Let me know your thoughts in a comment. See you next time.